Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here with me today. Today, my guest is Drew Vandenberg, and if you're not familiar with Drew, Drew is a recording engineer based out of Athens, Georgia. He has worked with artists such as Ra Ra Riot, Toro Imoy of Montreal, Kishi Bashi, Tall Tall Trees, Faye Webster, and a whole bunch more. And in this conversation, we have a great chat about a couple different things, one of which we get into is the idea of creating depth in your mixes. And Drew has a really refreshing approach to creating depth that doesn't require using effects like reverb and delay. Typically, when people talk about depth and ambience, a lot of people just gravitate towards talking about using effects. But Drew has a bit of a different take on it. And I think you're going to find his explanation of the tools he uses very fascinating because they absolutely work. But it's just an approach that not too many people think about. So I think you're going to find that part of the conversation very interesting. We also get into the conversation of creating great indie drum sounds. And if you've ever listened to any of Drew's recordings, he just has this knack for getting really cool dry tones that sound really fat. And I think that you're going to find it very fascinating when he talks about his approach for how he gets that, because he takes a slightly different approach when it comes to using things like overheads and stereo pairs. He he works with some unconventional mic techniques or not as common mic techniques when it comes to drums. And I think you're going to find everything he has to say there very fascinating. So with that said, let's just jump right into the interview, because I know you're going to find it very helpful. Drew Vandenberg, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you, man? Doing great. How are you, Mike? Doing fantastic. For people who might not be familiar familiar with you or your background, can you give us that story on how you got into music and into producing, engineering, and all the stuff you do now? Yeah, so I grew up, uh, I think like most of us that do this, being a musician first, I took piano from the age of about 4 to 10, 12, around there until I got bored of that and tired of my parents telling me to practice and decided I wanted to be a drummer for about four years and... Uh, they made the horrible mistake of buying me a drum kit. Um, <laughs> but like we have a, you know, we had a basement. So I think that's the only reason they probably said yes. Um, but yeah, I did that for about four or five years and then I kind of lost interest in that. And then I picked up the bass guitar and I played that for a while. But uh, um, my story is very much one of a, I don't want to say failed musician, but a, a uninterested musician. Um, I love the part of making music with other people, but I never had that passion for practice that I think, you know, like a lot of my friends who are amazing musicians, they literally could just sit behind the kit for three or four hours alone. And it it doesn't feel like a burden to them. Uh, Every minute I had to spend doing that stuff, I just was thinking about, okay, what else could I be doing with other people that'd be more fun than this? So when I was about 15, 16 years old, I read in the liner notes of a CD that I had gotten because I'm 36 now. So 15, I'm year 2000. Um, so I read, that was the first place I read that a recording engineer was a job. And this sounds made up, but I swear to God, this is what happened. Because <laughs> I grew up in a household with people who definitely are not musical, but my parents were, are very into music as fans. So I grew up surrounded by a very extensive cassette and CD collection. Vinyl wasn't cool again yet. My parents had their uh, old records, but I don't even, they didn't have a record player when I was growing up. It was cassettes and CDs. So I grew up around a ton of music and always loved it and grew up around people who loved music, but definitely not like a musical family. Um, when I read what that job was, I fired up the dial up modem and, uh, (laughs) not Googled it because Google didn't exist. And I like ask Jeeves or something. (laughs) Well, he's even pre Jeeves. I mean, it would probably be God, what was that thing called? Netscape? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think that was the browser <laughs> that we had at school. Uh, Nets, I probably Netscaped it. And I looked up what a recording engineer and producer was because I just never thought about it. You know, when you're a kid and you hear music, you got this plastic box with tape on it, music's coming out of it, or, or the shiny disc, music's coming out of it. It never once occurred to me that somebody is helping put that on it you know it, it just never it never crossed my mind I just music is music it's there um and when I looked up what it was I was I couldn't believe that that could be a job um it sounded like 
everything. It sounded like a combination of everything I, I already loved. I mean, side note to put a pin in this for a second. My dad is also a huge tinkerer, very big into computers. I grew up in a household where he was constantly making his own PCs and, uh, I got the kind of tinkering with electronics bug from him. So when I saw that this job existed where you listen to music all day, you help musicians record and capture their songs, and you get to tinker with electronics, I was kind of like, okay, that's what I'm going to (laughs) do. And I just literally knew that. I don't know. It sounds completely insane, but I just, I was like, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life, I think. And, uh, so I first got an internship. Uh, I didn't know how I would go about that at all. You know, I, I wasn't a kid who grew up, like so many people have that story where they're like, we, I got the cassette four track first and I did this and it, and I really wasn't, I came up in a weird age where, um, like around the exact same time I had the discovery Apple released garage band on their computers for free. And I didn't grow up in a Mac household. I grew up in a PC household because back then Macs were seen as expensive and uh, impractical. You know, my dad would make fun. My dad is tricked out in Apple gear now, but back then he would make fun <laughs> of me and say like, these, this, this stuff doesn't make sense. Now he's got like three Apple watches and a, a, <laughs> the nicest iPhone and a iPad pro and a MacBook pro. And sometimes I like to remind him of his, uh, snobby PC days. But anyway, back then I had one friend who's him and his dad, that was kind of their thing. They were like really into Macs. And so weirdly like garage band and screwing around with digital, very early digital recording. I guess that's not even that early in digital recording, but early accessible free digital recording is where I f- first kind of got into it, uh, messing around in garage band with my friends. But um, my first internship uh, I got was at this place called the 40 watt club here in Athens, which is kind of a famous club here in town. Um, I got an internship working for the booking agent there. And, uh, just to get my foot, I didn't know how, how do I go about becoming a recording engineer? So I, I just got this job as a high schooler in some part of the music business. And, uh, it was amazing. Valina was awesome person to learn from it back then. I still filled a lot of paper ticket orders and things like that, put up posters around town, but, Long story short, being there in high school meant that as long as I didn't try to drink, she would let me go to shows underage, which so like in this club, I got to see, you know, like Bright Eyes and The Strokes and The Flaming Lips and stuff and like Modest Mouse. And, uh, you know, I'm 16 or 17 and it was incredible, as you can imagine. Um, But after working there a short time, you know, I told her what I really wanted to be doing, which I want to be in a recording suit. I want to learn about this. And she introduced me to this uh, engineer here in town, David Barbie, um, said, you know, he owns this really cool studio, Chase Park Transduction. It's, uh, he's been an engineer around here for a long time, but he just opened this a few years ago. Um, you should reach out to him. So I, uh, emailed him or called him. I can't remember, but I got a job at Chase Park Transduction as an intern when I was, I was looking up this up with him the other day, cause it's the 25th anniversary of the studio. And I thought that I reached out when I was 16, but the earliest email I could find was when I was 17. But because uh, I was trying to figure out when is my 20th anniversary of starting working here, because I'm still here right now. Um, but uh, I'm sorry if this is very long winded and side story. No, it's great. I, lo- I, I love hearing like the journey that people take because it's not yeah. always like the most quickest story. You know, sometimes it does take a while. Yeah. So I I, I started interning for David some in high school and. Uh, was just fell in love as uh, like I was alluding to before I kind of had this weird experience where I messed around with garage band recording but I kind of had this weird thing where some of my first introduction to recording was actually just already being in a studio learning about recording instead of building up to it you know what I mean um, yeah so I I worked here on and off for the last two years of high school and then I applied to get into a program at Indiana University um, because they have a really awesome school of music there for performance. Like uh, it's competitive with Juilliard and all the big music schools around the country and the world, honestly. I mean, the kids there who are there for performance are, it it was wild being going up there and feeling like I'm really focused, committed to doing this thing. And then be like, never mind, I am a slacker. That kid (laughs) is in the basement of my dorm 
from the time I go to bed to I'm going up down there to get a pop tart in the morning before I go to class <laughs> and uh, their hands are bleeding and yeah I mean it's just like they they're for real being ar- being around those kind of musicians was definitely very inspiring and a, and a wake up call but uh so yeah I I got into Indiana University you know you know how the education system is in America it's very different than than Canada so uh, I picked IU because. Um, I'd heard good things about it. They don't let very many kids into the program a year, uh, per year. It's only 15 um, get into the recording arts program there. Um, it's a it's a public university, so it wasn't nearly as expensive as my other options. You know, back back even, you know, this is, God, almost 20, 18 years ago, there were a fraction of the college-based recording programs that exist than, than compared to exist now, you know? So, um you had things like USC and NYU and Miami, which are all fantastic schools, but all incredibly expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and then some of the other schools that got eliminated from contention for me were also because even if you're going into a recording program, if they're part of the school of music, you had to audition on an instrument, which I would have failed miserably at. That's not my thing. <laughs> um, so... I didn't go to, I got into NYU and Miami, but again, when I started to look at it, because my, my parents could help me out a little bit, they'd save some money, but I was taking out a lot of loans to go to college. And uh, when I started to crunch the numbers, especially for NYU, it's just like, not gonna, ha- <laughs> I can pay for two years of Indiana or one semester of NYU. So uh, that's kind of a no brainer for me. Yeah. But it ended up being an incredible decision. I can't, I, I tell people all the time, I cannot speak highly enough of the program at IU. Um, I mean, when I went, I told you they only let about 50, they let only let 15 kids in a year, but the admissions process when I went was crazy. And it's, it's different now. They made it way more uh, preliminary to, to arriving. But when I went, you got into IU, then you went up there for your first semester. And in your first semester, you took uh, basic electronics a basic music theory class, a basic sort of audio theory class. And then you kind of shadowed some of the kids that were in the program already to um, see what they were doing. Like, uh, because part of the program there is 80 hours a semester of live classical and jazz recording. And so you would like shadow kids, the kids who are already in on some of these sessions. And depending on how you did in these four classes and an interview, you got in your second semester. So there's, you know, hundreds of kids who've arrived here trying to get into this program. And, uh, you know, that's pretty overwhelming. First semester, freshman year, you're 18. I'm in a new state that I've never, I don't know that I'd ever been to to Indiana in my life before that. Um, Because it's about a 10 hour, well, Bloomington's about a nine hour drive from Athens, Georgia, where I'm from. But, uh, this was highly competitive, obviously. Only 15 of us are getting in. It was a really intense first semester. But um, me and a few other guys, instead of getting really cutthroat about it, actually kind of formed a study group. And uh, I think, uh, you know, it lo- was loosely seven or eight of us, let's say, and and five or six of us got in. Um you know, we probably accounted for a third or more of the program uh, out of out of the bat, <laughs> uh, th- th- those who were admitted that year. So uh, it was a wild process, but you know what? I made it a A plus on everything. I was not coming back here. I mean, the other thing is that I left out is my my dad's a university professor at University of Georgia, which is why I grew up in Athens. That's where the University of Georgia is. And uh, you know, I I love my dad, and UGA is an amazing school, but I definitely wanted to leave <laughs> where I was from and not yeah. uh, not feel like I was going to be stuck here at the time. So all that's just to say there's no, but my parents told me, you know, hey, well, because the other thing is that uh, the state of Georgia, like several other states in the United States, have programs where if you have above a certain grade point average, you can go to public university for almost free. And I was a pretty big nerd in, in high school. So I had a a high enough grade point average at the time where I could have gone to the University of Georgia for essentially free. So there is sort of like this thing looming in the background where if it didn't work out me getting into this program at IU, then there was no point in me staying at IU and I should come home and go to University of Georgia. 
So I had that f- extra incentive, you know, kind of lighting the fire under my ass to just be like, hell no, I'm not <laughs> going home. Um, so, uh, yeah, I got in and it was incredible. I mean, it, it was such a cool mixture of, um, yeah, and shout out to Conrad Strauss and Michael Stucker, um, two of my professors who are still there. Awesome guys. And Wayne Jackson, who's retired from there, but was also one of my teachers and uh, also my employer for his live sound company, who uh, was a rough man, but taught me a lot. I actually appre- appreciate my time with Wayne a lot because he'd put you under a lot of stress to get something done. So next time you're uh, behind a patch bay, uh, soldering hundred tiny patch bay points when there's not somebody standing over you yelling at you, it's definitely a lot easier, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was an amazing blend of learning about the science and the theory and, you know, it was designed where my history courses, for example, I took history of jazz and history of opera and, uh, history of the blues and, my science courses were physics of sound and electronics. And then, like I said, we recorded 80 hours a semester of live classical and jazz music. And that could be, you know, someone's seen or someone's uh, doctoral saxophone recital, or it could be La Boheme, the, the opera. You know what I mean? It's so you got, I got exposed to all these things I had no idea about. Um, and I really cherish my time there. I, I mean, I went full bore. I was, I worked in the, uh, audio repair shop for all four years there. I was on lighting and electrics crew at the opera house. I was a production manager for one of the concert halls there for a while. So, uh, it had a lot of opportunities to go even further than class and kind of just gain, uh, the hours of experience. I mean, I can't sit down anymore because I don't do it as much and like sit and fully just break down a schematic for you in two seconds. I could do that at one point, but I can tell you, I've definitely put in the, uh, the 10,000 hours with the soldering iron. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, were you in school, like you left the studio to go to school and then you came back? Was that kind of how it yeah, all Yeah, so I, I moved, I, since I already had my foot in the door here uh, at this great studio, I decided to move back to Athens after college because I didn't really have a plan. And I had to do an internship for credit. So I just figured out ah, the easiest place is just to come back and um, yeah, just got kind of sucked back in. Um, and I, I, I love it here. My, I met my wife when I was in college. She's from Los Angeles originally, but uh, she graduated a year behind me and she moved down here also. Um, My girlfriend at the time, we weren't married yet, but uh, yeah, so yeah, came back to Athens and I've been at David's studio working out of it ever since. That's, yeah, about 15 years ago. Amazing. What's kind of funny is that you were talking earlier about how when you started learning music and playing instruments, you, you had mentioned that there was like, it felt like a burden to practice and to get good at that. And then you fell in love with the audio engineering side of it. And I'm curious to know, what was that practice curve like for you when you got into the audio engineering side of it? Because there it does require some practice, you know, like you do have to yeah. get, get your ears up to speed and, you know, understand what you're listening for and all that stuff. So, you know, what kind of things were you doing to actually work on your audio skills and and practice that craft? Well, so like I said, IU emphasizes a lot of hands-on learning. So um, outside of the live recording class that I spoke about, I mean, that was a great way to learn quick and dirty. You know, I mean, we had mics hung permanently in a lot of these concert halls, but depending on the type of thing you need to record, it's like, bing, bang, boom, you got to get this up fast. You got to get levels. It's got to sound good quickly. So learning how to do even a rudimentary recording setup quickly, that, that sounds good. Um, you know, I got a ton of experience doing that, but we also had classes that literally were just, you know, you have to find a band yourself and you have to make a recording of this band and you have to bring it to class and you're going to be reviewed by your teacher and sort of peer commented on reviewed. So it was very much like, um, we had multiple studios that we had keys to and you'd sign up for times. And it it was sort of, you know, you could do less and pass these courses and do what you needed to do. I mean, they, they weren't easy on you, but you could do enough to get by or because of the access they gave you, you could go above and beyond and use the studios anytime they weren't being used. So like, that's what me and my friends were doing, you know, we were like, 
I wasn't a great musician, but I was recording my friend's bands all the time. And then of course, you know, these are the people that I lived with all four years of college too. So we start to get recording setups in our basement and I bought this weird little console from Chicago for $300 and that, that was set up in one of our houses. And it's just, it would just, to practice my craft, it was really like just as much recording all the time as possible. I mean, I dove in head first. Like college to me is just a blur of crazy amount of recording, electronics repair, drinking, wake up the next day, repeat. Just like <laughs> I was going full bore all four years, 100% of the time, work hard, play hard, go, 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 go. And uh, yeah, just also being, you know, we, you form a little... I don't want to say like a coalition, but kind of like a bond with all your other recording friends in the years above you and below you, you know? I mean, once you're in there for a couple of years, there's kids coming up behind you that are fresh and new into this thing too. And it's like, yeah, I befriended a lot of those kids, you know? And, and we had parties and it's like, always invite them over too. And it, it was very like, uh, I don't know, it felt like a family, you know? Yeah. Like a lot of those people are still my very good friends today, even though most of them don't even do audio anymore. Um you know, I think from my 15 people, there's probably me and three other people that do work with audio professionally for a living. Um, one's in, he does Atmos mixing for f uh, film and documentaries and sound design stuff up in New York. One of them works for Sony PlayStation out in San Diego. One of them has a studio in Minneapolis and one of them, uh, I think does live sound still in the Indianapolis area. So I guess that's four other people, but there's somebody from the year, two years below me that is like, I don't know how many Grammys she has already. My <laughs> friend, Laura Sisk is Jack Antonoff's engineer. Oh wow! So she's, uh, yeah, <laughs> she's a couple years younger than me. And I, yeah, like I said, I don't remember how many times something Laura has engineered has won versus been nominated, but uh, it's an insane amount. <laughs> but it's kind of funny because, like, I had the same sort of experience in college where, like, you very quickly see the people who are hungry for this and who want to use up all that studio time and bring in the bands and all that kind of stuff. It's very easy to spot that, like, probably, you know, at the time, maybe five to ten people in your in your class that are, like, hungry for this. And, and you're right. Like, those are always the people that you – befriend and that you just like work on a lot of projects with and like those are usually the people that end up succeeding outside of it because you could tell they're hungry for it whereas like a lot of people just go through the motions and they're like yeah i'm gonna learn this stuff and you know maybe i'll get a job afterwards that kind of thing but yeah i think unfortunately it's a it's a major it seems like an appealing major to pick if you're just like yeah i love music and i'm into m making music and i just like want to smoke weed and not go be in quote unquote real school it's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? But our yeah. program was definitely not, you would, I mean, there were people like that, but it was rigorous. And, and, you know, I will also say that some of the people who don't do audio anymore that are still my close friends from that class, it's not that they weren't hungry and motivated or that they weren't good at it. Some of them, their life just took them in completely different directions or they just got really passionate about other things. I mean, true. one of my best friends from college has amazing ears and is an amazing musician. And he made a go of this for a bit, but he just got really passionate about, well, the broader category of drink, coffee, kombucha, mm. brewing his own beer. And now he owns, co-owns, I think two cafes and two restaurants in Indianapolis. Wow. And like is into making as many of the ingredients and syrups as he can from scratch. And like, he just got, he moved actually here to Athens for a few years to like kind of make a go of it with me doing some stuff. Then he just started messing around with like roasting coffee and learning about coffee from a local coffee place. And he just went like 180 degrees in a different direction. Yeah. I guess when you find what you're passionate about, you, you kind of go all in. Yeah. Now he's just like wildly obsessive about that. Like he was about audio briefly. Yeah. Love it, man. Another friend of mine even went as far as to get his library sciences degree. And he was working in the audio archives here at our special collections library at UGA. And he, similar thing, a different kind of drink, but he got way into cider. 
And now he lives in Washington State and has bought a chunk of land with his wife, and they're slowly building up a cider orchard. Cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's not just all, like, pothead dropouts not getting into it, but there definitely were some kids in my class that was like, oh, you're here because you think this is, you're like a, gr- you're like a good musician and you can kind of get by on this. But yeah, for sure. You're definitely not doing this as a career. I think part of that has to do with like guidance counselors sometimes too. Like sometimes they don't really understand the industry. So they're just like, I remember my guidance counselor asking me like, you know, what, what interests you? And I was like, I don't know, marketing's kind of cool. And she was like, cool, go, go into marketing. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, you know, what? That's what? <laughs> great advice. That's like, yeah, thanks. uh, yeah, nothing's, no, there's no better advice than someone just repeating back to you what you've just said to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because then I was like, I'm also yeah. into music. And they're like, well, become a musician. I was like, okay, you clearly don't understand how the industries work here. <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, guidance counselor job is, I guess, for left for people who uh, have no, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. There, I'm sure there's a lot of great guidance counselors. Yeah, but there are, I've had sure. experiences like that as well, where it's just like, what did you just just repeat back. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> not not helpful. I mean, yeah. I mean, dude, it's like that uh even just explaining to regular people what this is. It's true. You know what it is we do. Like even my parents who are very supportive of me, well, you know, they don't they didn't understand what this was or what it means. It's a it's a weird confluence of many things and and uh I mean, oftentimes honestly at Parties where I get tired of people asking me, like, you record anyone famous? You know, I just tell them, I work in the music industry and I make my job sound as boring as possible because I don't like to explain <laughs> it or like I find it difficult to explain to people. I get it. Um, I, yeah, my, fa- my parents are the same way. It makes way. you sound really cynical and mean, but I, I, but I just mean like, I don't know, sometimes I just want to make it sound like what I do is really dumb and boring so people will stop asking me questions. <laughs> my parents are the same way. I, I heard my mom even last weekend like talking to someone and, and she was like, yeah, Michael is in music. Like, like he's a musician. I was like, you don't understand what I do at all. It's, it's, let's, yeah. just, let's just agree, okay, I'm in music and that's it. <laughs> my, my parents get it now. Like I've taken them to the studio here a bunch of times and at IU and like they kind of, yeah. under they, they get it now. They get but, it now, yeah. I mean, God, when I first met my in-laws, they thought I was, um, I mean, try explaining to somebody, you know, who's obviously concerned about their daughter's future that, you know, you can actually make a living what you're doing, being self-employed. It sounds... I mean, you sound, yeah, you sound like a huckster, like you're making it up. You're making up this job <laughs> on the fly off the top of your head. Everything's going to be fine. I put bands in a room and I put microphones up and they pay me. And it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a secure future uh, for my daughter. <laughs> I mean, Love I can't it. really blame them, but it also it took many years before they're like, oh, okay, like this is, yeah. a, this is an okay, stable situation. Gotcha. <laughs> Well, I'd love to talk a little bit about your productions and and what you do. Uh, so, so if if your in laws are listening to this, they can understand it a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> but um, one of the, one of the things that I noticed when I was listening to your uh, Spotify discography playlist, and w- one thing that really stood out to me that I really liked was that you seem to you you do a really great job of balancing wet and dry sounding elements in your mixes and and i think that like for example like you might have like really wet sounding vocals that have like a big lush reverb or whatever but then you'll have like super tight dry sounding drums and i really liked the juxtaposition of those things and how it made the mixes feel like they have a lot more depth and you know versus versus someone who just sends everything to the same reverb because i feel like that happens a lot in, in mixing as well so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your approach to creating mixes that have that depth and ambience and how you make those decisions of, you know, when you're going to use an effect on a track versus leaving something super dry. Yeah. I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about space. Um, I'm not a visual person per se. I'm not someone who goes into pro tools and like color highlights my tracks or needs to think about anything in an organized way visually like that. But I, I, orally think about space a lot like that matters to me a ton and i and i actually think that almost every decision i make in a weird way is related to how somebody is going to spatially relate to it right like sure reverb is a spatial effect you can push something further back or closer but in a way compression is too you know if you're you're changing the uh, envelope of a sound and and making it feel like 
okay, the um, lower part of the waveform is suddenly louder and and closer to the attack of a waveform, then you've essentially given it the same feeling as being closer to you. Um, it, same thing with EQ, right? If you brighten something up, it, it, it has the same effect as how our ears would per- perceive something in nature if it was closer or further away, if something's a little more dull. Um, so uh, it's cool to hear you say that because I think about it all the time. Like I think about how far back or how wide, I don't get into some of the crazy widener stuff that people do. Like I don't really like the way that MS sounds. Most of the time it I feel like I can feel the phasiness too much. I mean, other people do it to great effect, but for me, every time I've ever messed with it, I'm like, this is, makes my head feel queasy (laughs) and it feels strange. But um, yeah, so I I really just, when I'm sitting down, I think about from the very beginning of even when I'm going to record a song or like, because I'm the type of person, I like to get a source as close to how it's going to sound in the final production from the gate. Like it's, it's really important to me. I don't do the thing where I have an amp track on a guitar or two amp tracks, and then each of those have two mics and then it has a DI just in case, or, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. Some people get great sounds, but for me, it's like, I want to get the sound and I want to commit. Now I might use more than one mic or more than one amp to do that, but I'm just going to commit that as a track of sound or a stereo track of sound. You know, I, I, use the effects pedals that I want to use. I turn the amp reverb on that I want to use. And then I, from my, the beginning of my basic track, I yeah, have a discussion with the artist. Okay, are these going to be dry drums? Uh, do you want this, the drums to feel small and the guitars to be big? You know, we I have conversations from the very beginning that are going to affect the dis- spatial decisions you're asking about from the very, very, very beginning. Like using Faye Webster, Webster as an example. I know Faye loves her vocals very dry and very upfront, right? So then it's about, okay, what, how, how can we make other things feel enveloping around that? Uh, you like, you'll notice the drums in a lot of her productions have kind of a, not blown out in any way, but kind of a natural big room sound on the drums so that it feels more like she's standing in the middle of this, I don't know. I, like the band is around her. Um, and so it's like, I don't want this in your face, tight snare and kick drum sound. If I have this huge vocal that I'm trying to get up front in front of everything. Now, some people want both those things at the same time. And, and there's tricks to do that. I think in a lot of, uh, you know, R and B or hip hop productions, they do an incredible job of, um, using ducking and, and compression and, and things like that to make it so that, they have their cake and eat it too in, in those ways. And I think it's uh, actually some of the most exciting mixing really happens in that world a lot of times to me, uh, even though that's, you know, top 40 hip hop couldn't be the furthest thing from what I do. I have a like a tremendous amount of respect for some of the things that people are doing in that world. But anyway, yeah, like using Faye for example, it's like, I want, I want the pedal steel to be around here. I want the keys to feel like they've sort of melted in behind her. I, I want the drums. I'm leaning a lot on the room mics because I want it to feel like it's wrapped around her and she's standing in the room, you know? So then that way, nothing is interfering with this like humongous sounding vocal that's in the middle. Um, that's just one example. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but I mean, so it sounds like you're kind of, you're, you're just kind of, having conversations early on with your artist to figure out what kind of sound they're going for and then shaping everything around that, that sound. Exactly. But, but I think about, like I said, I think about compression, not just as a dynamic tool, but as a spatial tool as well. I think depending on how you compress something, you're making something, a source feel closer or further away, depending on how you're doing it. Yeah. I love that. uh, Same thing with EQ. You know, if I want to make something sound like it's a little further away, taking some presence off of it is a good way to do that. So I, I just think there's, I try to really get into other interesting ways to mess with space other than just time-based spatial effects, I guess, to answer your question. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. And that's actually a really good answer because you're absolutely right. Like when you actually pay attention to how sound works and how it exists in the real world, it's like, yeah, something that's further away doesn't have that top-end presence, you know? And, and And so when you're aware of that stuff, you can 
shape your sounds that way with with EQ and compression. And uh, yeah, I think one of the my, my one of my first observations of that was I worked in audio post production for a number of years, and and seeing how the the main mixers would would constantly be shaping things to make it sound further away or closer away, especially whenever we were doing like anything ADR based where like someone was coming in and re-recording their lines. It was like, we had to match that ambience. So if they're sitting, if they're far away from the camera, how do we make them sound far away from the camera when they're recording right into a mic in, in our studio, you know, like, so it, it's interesting because yeah, you can definitely get away with adding a lot of depth and uh, that kind of stuff with EQ and compression. And uh, yeah, I think that's a, a really cool uh, approach to it as opposed to just, yeah, let's drown it in reverb and hope that that makes it sound further away. Yeah. Cause I, I think that's different. I mean, I think, I think about, I probably spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about the Fletcher Munson curve and thinking about the way the human ear works. And, uh, I, I joked multiple times, although maybe it won't be a joke one day that I'm going to get the Fletcher Munson curve as like a huge tattoo back piece, um, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, so if I'm ever in an accident, people, they'll be able to surely identify my body. They'll be like, Oh, what the hell? This guy has a graph on his back. Um, but, uh, no, I think about, yeah, that's sort of what I, yeah. I, speaking of film though, that's something I often fantasize. Like maybe I'll spend the second half of my career doing that. I, I, you know, I, I, I know it's not that easy. You don't just get to walk in the door for making records and start doing cool stuff in the film world. But, uh, the, those couple of friends I mentioned, the one in gaming and the one in sound for film. I mean, I talk to them fairly frequently about what they're doing, and it, you know, it sounds extremely tedious. But hey, so's making records <laughs> and nowadays, <laughs> and uh, but it also sounds so cool. Like it's building a whole sure. world out of sound. It's kind of amazing to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. It's it's. Uh you know, in, in music, it's like, you, you know, you, you end up with like a handful of instruments and however many tracks that is, you know, you might be working on a track that or, or a mix that has like 50 tracks, but in film, it's like 200 is kind of like, you know, normal because yeah. <laughs> you're going to have all these little like five second clips of audio and you have to then figure out how that works into the equation and mix it fast. And, you know, it's, e it's easy to get lost in those little five second samples, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think whenever also you're working in audio for a visual medium i think unfortunately video people always treat you uh second fiddle as well at least that's been my experience working on some music videos and things like that shots fired at video world <laughs> from audio world nice. that's my hot take uh no but it seems it does seem i mean getting to help somebody who's building a world visually fill that out with sound is very very cool to me yeah it's interesting well, another element of your mixes that I wanted to ask about is your drum sounds. Um, I think you have this really cool knack for creating drums that feel really dry and tight, but they still sound beefy and like have a lot of weight to them. And I was wondering if you could share your approach, like when it comes to drums, what you like to do, how you like to start off a drum recording and how, like what you, what kind of decisions you're making to get those tones. Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of it starts with the room first and how I'm deciding to treat the room. So the room at Chase Park and the A room is pretty live, but we have baffles on wheels we can move around. And you can also flip the baffles from wood to uh, treated insulation, like a cloth uh, covering over some insulation. So uh, pulling those further away or closer uh, and then deciding what side you're flipping them to has a huge impact on the sounds I'm trying to get. You know, like there's a... I don't know how I describe them. Post punk, punkish band. I don't know. Band called Faux Ferocious that I work with. And it's like they want super tight, kind of in your face drum. So I'm going to pull those walls in really close. And uh, I've got an old back of a futon bed that I'll put over the top of the baffles I put in and slide some uh, sound paneling over the top of them to even make a roof sometimes on top of my little booth there if I want to go super tight. But um, yeah, the but the room here it also has a lot of heft to it. There's definitely like quite a bit of buildup from, I don't know, 50 to 250 or something like that. There seems like there's this little bump. So that's a big part of, I think a lot about, again, this is just so boring, but I mean, from the very beginning, I'm thinking I'm, it's, it's how you tune the kit. I spend a lot of time at the beginning picking and choosing what drums I'm going to use and, and tuning them correctly for the room. I mean, it's not just also at Chase Park though. This would be more helpful for the folks recording at home. I mean, I spend a lot of time 
especially when I was younger, but I still do, you know, budgets being the way they are. Sometimes I find myself recording in odd situations. That's not your ideal studio situation. So I might be in someone's living room because we've done as much as we can at the studio and the budget is dried up and we got to get this thing done. So I think, you know, the first thing is really that I do always is listening to the room and thinking like, okay, what are the assets? Like what is good sounding about this space and what is bad sounding about this space and what can I do about that? Um, uh, which will determine how I'm liking something always. You know, if it, if it's, okay, I got a room, it's kind of small, it's kind of boxy, I do not want to hear these reflections or you're going to be able to tell I'm in this tiny boxy room. I'm going to do a lot of close miking. you know? I'm going to do a lot of close miking, and if I need to add a little space later, I'll pull up some altiverb or something like that. But um, in terms of get, like how I get punchy sounds, I'm very into making sure phase is correct as well. Uh, I think that's super important, especially with drum sounds. I mean, I find that so many times if I'm getting tracks from somebody else mixing and I'm like, God, I can't get this kick drum to sound like anything. And sometimes you go down this rabbit hole. Even I do after all these years where I chase my, my tail for 30 minutes. And then I'm like, oh yeah, just flip the polarity button and I'll flip it on the overheads and be like, well, duh, there's all of your drum sound. <laughs> um, I pay attention a lot to that, which means um, I don't put, I, I I put a snare top and snare bottom mic on there a lot of times, but oftentimes I'm barely using the snare bottom or not at all. But uh, I don't like double mic toms. I don't, I do a kick in and kick out depending on the kick drum. Also, I, I really think uh, getting that knock from the front of the kick drum is really important. But so for like this old Ludwig kit we have here, I hang a little small diaphragm condenser mic down into the kick drum uh, and aim the diaphragm right at the beater. So I'm getting a lot of boom from it, but it's a lot of nice punch without being too clicky. And then, uh, well, from classical recording all the time, I learned about different stereo miking techniques. So I'm very much into, I don't like the, this is another hot take, I don't like the spread overheads s separated over top of a uh, drum kit. I use uh, XY, a pair of cardioids, uh, over the center of the snare drum as my overhead configuration 95, 98% of the time um, because I think that eliminates tons of phase issues that I've run into listening to other people's drum sounds. Um, I think it makes a tighter, punchier kit image overall. And I think it's also actually, without having to rely on MS or anything, you can make that quite a wide image if you want. Um, the other technique I use in front of the kick drum for my room mics, or like, they're not my far away room mics, but a closer room mic, is a figure eight bloom line pair. Um, another stereo miking technique that I learned from classical music recording. Um, but so it's like, my stereo pairs are very, very, very in phase. So the main things creating my stereo images are extremely in phase with each other. And from there I can adjust, you know, my spot mics on individual drums. Yeah, so that, that's kind of how I'm, I'm doing it. I'm very conscious of, of phase, especially. I'm very conscious of all the boring things. I'm sorry, there's not some more exciting trick, but. But that is the thing that like, just because it's boring, like a lot of people do skip over it, you know? So uh, yeah. I think that it's, it's definitely worth talking about. And I love that you, that's, that's a really interesting approach to just kind of make everything a really tight stereo pair, as opposed to having that big spaced out setting. So as far as like checking for phase, since, since people seem to want to skip over it cause it's boring, let's, let's get into the boring stuff. What do you do to check your face? Like, w do you have a specific process that you usually follow? Like, do you just start with the overheads and just check everything against that? Or w what's your approach with that? Well, first I'll make sure if I have a kick in or kick out mic, you know, I'll check, I'll check them on the individual, the kick and the snare drum, making sure those things are working together. And then, yeah, I'll go through and check each. I'll basically like, say for example, I have my overheads as a stereo pair. I have my front of the kick, front of the kit you know, bloom line pair. And then I might have like a distant pair of Omni condenser microphones, like in Chase Park a lot up, up on top of the uh, playback monitors in the studio, there's a pair of omnidirectional earthworks mics facing the wall. So say I've got all three of those. The first thing I do once I know my 
you know, individual drum mics are in phase with each other is I check them versus each of those pairs of things. And then I'll make a note, you know, like, okay, the kick is out of phase with the overheads, but the snare's not. But then in the front of kit mic, the snare is out of phase, but the kick is not. But in the distant mics, both of them are out of phase. So then you think about, okay, from there, what am I flipping? What polarities do I need to flip here? You know, and you kind of look at it on the sheet and you decide, okay, well, I'll flip the far mics because both things are out of phase. Oh, you got to check the toms too. So, you know, it becomes almost like a grid in your mind of like, oh, almost like a Boolean logic puzzle. It, it puzzle like if this, or, or that's really and or, that's Boolean logic. But yeah, it's like, if this, then that. If not this, then that. So it's it's sort of a, uh, yeah, basically I'll check them versus each pair and then decide, okay, well, if I flip this tom and the kick drum, then that solves the phase problems in my three different stereo pairs. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's like finding the thing, finding the easiest path to them being all in phase. Yeah, it's a it's a weird little puzzle you have to do you have to unlock. And is it just um, switching the polarity switch that you're doing, or are you actually physically moving mics? Yeah, sometimes I'll physically move mics. I mean, a uh, helpful rule for people to know is that if you want to avoid phase issues, typically um, uh, if you have two microphones on the same source and you're not like trying to close mic something, but you have like a close mic and a distance mic, there's the kind of rule of uh, three times the distance. So if you have something more than, you know, this this is different frequency to frequency with low end, you have, you know, three times the distance isn't always going to cut it, but because um, your wavelengths are much larger. But um, if you have a mic typically three times the distance from the source as the other mic, you're going to avoid most phase issues. So um, not all of them, of course. I'm not saying that 100% applies all the time, especially to low end, like I said, but I try to keep that in mind as well. You know, like I try to keep my, even my closer drum room mic, I try to make it three times the distance from the drums that any close mic is. Um, but yeah, so I, I will mostly do the polarity flip. I'll, I'll scooch mics a little bit if I need to, especially if they're on the same source. Um, and then for anything I don't catch after the fact... You know, I know a lot of people are really into time aligning microphones after the fact uh, to get things into polar uh, in, in phase with each other. I mean, and I think that can be effective, but I th also think you have to be careful because if you're trying to create a sense of space and you time align your distant mics to your close mics, like it will still sound further away, and that this, like we talked about, the frequency response is different, the sound of it is different, but you've lost the actual time difference delay between the two because you yeah. just scooched them up on top of each other. Well, so I, I guess that's, sorry, I was going to say, I guess that's kind of a good distinction to make for people is that phase and polarity aren't the same thing. You know, right. Phase You're has, flipping the polarity to get something in phase with each other. Exactly. Yes. Right. And, and yeah, yeah. The, the phase has to do with the timing differences. So in the case of a drum kit, for example, you're going to have your close mics and you're going to have your room mics and sound is going to hit the room mics at a slower speed than the close mics because they are further right. away. And because yeah. of that, the polarity may shift in relation to everything else with the close right. mics. So, yeah. yeah, just just so people understand the concept of like, yeah, you're not trying like like what you said with time alignment, like people do feel like, oh, they look they look at their waveforms and it's like, well, these are off. So I guess we need to sync them up. And it's like, well, may, then you've lost your depth. That is being right. when you're perceived when there. you're recording an acoustic instrument, you have to be careful with that. Now, if it's a bass uh, amp mic and then a bass DI, maybe that's not so important. You know, I'll do that sometimes if it's a recording that I'm mixing for somebody else and I notice they're a little off from each other. It's like that's an okay time, I think, to scooch things. You're talking about. 50 milliseconds you know what i mean and, yeah you're not uh, trying to simulate a room sound out of it exactly exactly so i think that's really uh, i i pick and choose those mo moments carefully especially if it's recording an acoustic source yeah i love that um as far as the drum sounds go you had talked about um baffling the kits to make them sound 
pretty tight. And I love the idea of like kind of creating like a roof with a futon. It's such a, a, a yeah. simple way to do it. Um, what about like, do you ever use like towels or those like uh, big fat snare drum rings that you can get for the snare? Yep. Like, do, you, do you do that kind of stuff to kill them up? Yep. Tea towels, moon gels, whatever gets the job done to get the tone you need to get. Um, you know, I, I work with some really amazing drummers who are also very good at, at doing some tuning things where they can get those drums singing with very minimal treatment. Even like I've seen drummers, I I'm pretty good at drum tuning just from a long time experience, but I'm not going to say that I'm like on the level of these, some of these drummers, you know? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of shocked sometimes. I'll have something plastered in moon gels and one of those big fat snare rings. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this is what I had to do to get it. And they'll just be like, can you take all that crap off? And then they retune it and then they put like one piece of tape on it and it sounds the same as what I just did. I'm like, well, I guess I have a lot to learn still. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, sometimes you want that, people love that super dead towel drum sound. I'll do things like that as well. If I'm, I'm, I'm really just open to, like I said, I have discussions with artists at the beginning or before we start a song. It's like, what are we doing here? What what picture are we trying to paint? And uh, then figuring out how do we do that, you know? Yeah. When it comes to the dry sounding drums, do you feel like low tunings are better than high tunings? I typically like, well, it's, I don't know if I can say typically one is better than the other. It's so situational. I personally love mostly very fat, thick snare drum sounds, for example. I'm not, I've never been a fan. Maybe it's just because I grew up in the, uh, my childhood was mostly in the 90s and, and early aughts. And maybe it's just a rejection of radio rock from that time with like the crazy tuned up snare drums, like 311 high pitched, like ding, all this sustain and stuff. I like fat and dead, chunky snare, snare sounds, you know? Yep. Totally. I, you know, I mean, it's, there, there's a time and place for both of those, I guess. But. For sure. Yeah. I think if you're articulating something if like playing fast music, you know, something that's a little more metal or punk or something like that, where it's like a busy, fast tempo song, you can't get caught that, caught with like a floppy snare drum and a floppy floor tom, you know, or your toast. Same thing with the kick drum. It's funny. I, I love a lot of booty in my kick drum. I love a lot of bass, but that was a lesson I had to learn when I was younger of like, no, if somebody's playing at like 150 BPM and it's this punk song, all you're going to hear is, it doesn't make any sense. It's not punchy, you know? So yeah, it's very situational for me. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting because it's, you know, when it comes to drums, there's, there's like tempo based decisions you have to make, right? Like the faster the song, the less space there is between notes. So you kind of have to go for a tighter sound and maybe that is, maybe that does require yep. a little bit more dampening to, you know, kill off some of the sustain so you don't have that rumble throughout your whole track, you know, so that, that's definitely something to consider. And the tuning itself can also play a big role with that because, yeah, the lower the tuning, generally the more sustain and resonance you get off, get off of it. Um, so, yeah, there is a kind of that balance of, like, understanding when to be using damp dampening or tuning and finding what fits best for the song that you're working on. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, again, it goes back to, like, that's not just a spatial decision. That's not just about how far are we putting these microphones or making this space feel big or small. It's that just bound down to the fundamental instrument can also make something sound uh, inappropriately big or small, depending on yeah, the tempo. For sure. Well, another element of the drum kit that I'm curious to get your take on is cymbal selection. Cause that's also another big thing that, you know, a lot of drummers just bring yeah. in whatever they've got, but that can drastically change the the space and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, you know, how much energy do you generally put into symbol selection? A lot, you know, that will change song to song. It also depends on, on the album, but, um, you know, some drummers we work with have really beautiful symbols. And, but we also record a lot of, uh, I mean, I work with a lot of artists outside of Athens as well, but within Athens, it, it's a very cool community to live in because there's tons of, young up and coming bands, um, you know, in college or just out of college who maybe can't afford nice instruments yet. So we do keep a selection of symbols of a few, uh, nice symbols, a couple pairs of hi-hats. We like a couple crashes, a couple rides, pretty meat and potatoes, but stuff, you know, you can throw up 
and it's going to sound good. Um, hope, well, depend, depending on the drummer. Do you prefer like darker sounding cymbals? I think in, if I had to pick one direction that I skew, yes. But again, you know, it completely depends on the context. Yeah. I do like kind of darker, trashier sounding hi-hats for the most part. And, and same thing um, with a ride. But, you know, a dark, washy ride, like we just said, that's not going to work on something where somebody's really got to articulate the ride symbol. And uh, especially if they're playing at a faster tempo. But I would say, yeah, if you asked me to pick which direction do I skew, it would definitely be darker yep. symbols. Yeah, sure. and again, it, it all does come down to that context, not just tempo-wise as well, but like musically, if, if you're, you know, if it's like a heavier like metal song or something like that, there's going to be a lot of stuff happening in that low end. So you need to have an instrument that, sticks out above that and so you want to pick stuff that is a little bit brighter so that it does kind of shine through a little bit more um so yeah to your ride example like that that's a good example there too where it's like yeah if you have something really heavy where there's tons of low end rumble you need that brighter sound to cut through the mix a lot more so um yeah just something for people to consider as they are working on their drums um i know that we, we don't have too much more time left but i do want to ask you about true blue records because that's a record label that you've put out and uh I'm curious to curious to to dive a little bit into that because you were and maybe you still are putting out some limited edition vinyl singles and donating the proceeds to local charities and I just think that that's such a, a really cool thing. Um, you know, I, I really do. I'm a big believer in the fact that music can have a very very positive impact in the world, and uh, and I love that idea of you know giving back to charity. So I'm curious to know like how you started that and why you started that. Yeah, well, uh, I should clarify one thing. So. True Blue Records was a record label I started a few years ago with a couple partners, and uh, that has since closed and was a, I mean, some of the music we put out was cool, but I also would say that that was a financial failure. (laughs) But separate from that, what you're actually referring to is Athens Resonates, which has been a uh, huge success, which is... Uh, I did sell those records through my label, True Blue Records. and uh, But Athens Resonates still exists now. Okay, good. And uh, what Athens Resonates is, is a local charitable organization I started that um, it's got multiple sort of levels to what we're trying to do. But basically, we are raising money for two local organizations. One is the Athens Area Boys and Girls Club, which I'm involved with helping... Uh, run their music makers program, which is teaching kids after school about production and songwriting. And, uh, because at at our fourth street location here, um, in Athens, somebody, when it was originally built, I think a fourth street location has been there over 10 years now, but, um, somebody donated money to actually have a small studio built in there. And then they did some stuff with it for a few years and then they couldn't find the right instructors. And so it kind of fell by the wayside. And so a couple of years before the pandemic, we kind of helped me, me and my friend, uh, Adriana helped sort of resurrect it. And, uh, yeah, so there's that program. And then we have an amazing organization in Athens called Nucci space, which is a, uh, mental, primarily it's a mental health resource center for musicians and other folks in town. Um, but they also, uh, provide, uh, physical health resources and, uh, music camps for kids. There's a studio there. There's a venue. There's about 10 practice spaces. It's uh, just an incredible community resource. Like, I can't emphasize enough what they mean to Athens and what they do for the area. It's truly amazing. Um, So all of our money goes to those two organizations. But so what we are is a collective of what I like to call creative businesses. So it's um, record labels, vinyl pressing, studio, um, uh, gra- graphic design and screen printing shop, um, restaurants, brewers, and uh, promotion people. And so basically anything that's part of the creative economy in Athens, it's not everybody, but it's a kind of loose coalition that people have come in and out of at different times. But what we do is I record local acts here at Chase Park, live to half-inch two-track tape in the studio. So I'm mixing on the fly as well. My stereo mix is the mix that's happening while the band is playing um, through our old 53 Series uh, Neve console next door. And uh, everything is filmed as well by a a local production company called Chispa House. Um, They're a big part of this too. And so... 
the proceedings are filmed and then recorded live to half inch. So the band and I both have to get this thing right. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll do more than one take uh, for sure. You know, if something goes awry, but, uh, it's really fun. It's really thrilling. It's real crazy. It's, it's, uh, adrenaline pumping depending on what's going on. And then we'll press up a limited edition of 300 of each record. And, uh, the, each series of five covers is designed by a local visual artist here in town as well. Um, and, uh, then we put on events where the visual artists could, uh, show their work. And then we have the bands play the band play and other bands as well. We try to make like a big thing out of it. We also put up, uh, hand screened, hand screen printed artwork, uh, excuse me, posters of the album cover artwork for each edition as well. And uh, so like I had a bowling tournament before the pandemic where it was bands versus businesses and then a bunch of bands played in the bowling alley. Uh, I had an event at Creature Comforts, which is one of our big local breweries here to celebrate the opening of their new outdoor patio. I had uh, our local um, council person, Mariah Parker, is a really great hip hop artist named Linkwa Franca. And they... Uh, we did a single together and then I did one with the future birds and on the theater of the, uh, on the rooftop of the Georgia theater here, we had like a co-headlining bill with them. And so, um, I did a live during, once the pandemic happened, I did a live kind of like telethon for Athens resonates with Kishibashi and Cicada Rhythm and Tall Tall Trees all playing together and then playing as each other's band. So I really try to do something special for each release event. And bef- unfortunately, we were only existed for about a year before the pandemic, you know, pulled the rug out from under us. But we're coming back this year. T. Hardy Morris, a local artist who's on New West, is going to be the next release. And we're having an event here July 23rd that I'm still figuring out the details for. But before the pandemic, we made uh, about $20,000 um, in a year just from that. So highly successful I know it could be successful again, and uh, I'm really looking forward to ramping it back up. I mean, honestly, I'm sometimes, well, often lately, feel, well, not to sound mopey or anything, but I feel more passionate about that stuff than I do about just making records all day. <laughs> but, but man, that that's so cool. Like, I, I really do appreciate that you're doing that. I think that, um, yeah, it's not just always about, like, turning knobs and making music. It's, like, sometimes there there's a really rewarding feeling of giving back. And, uh, I love that you're using your skills to be able to give back to these communities and get, give back to this, these charities. And, um, I just think that that's such a cool thing that the audio industry doesn't talk a lot about. And so, so when I saw that you were doing that, I thought like, yeah, we got, we got to talk about that because there's, there's a lot of positive impact that could be made from people if, you know, if people give back. Um, and, uh, definitely like I, I felt very inspired by it as well. So, you know, I, I, well, thank I'm you. glad that you're, that you're, that you're pursuing that. I think that's really awesome. Yeah. Thank you for asking me about it. I'm, I have something I'm extremely passionate about and I'm looking forward to bringing it back and, and figuring out ways we can be impactful going, going forward. Yeah. Amazing. Do you have any advice for it? I'm sure there's other listeners who are probably feeling the same way that are like, yeah, I've always wanted to give back, but I don't really know, you know, where to start with that stuff. So what, what advice would you give to those people? Well, I think you got to figure out a way, you know, one of the things I had to really come to terms with, um, and this was before the pandemic even, but because I think I came up with the idea in 2018 or 2017, it took me about a year to get it together, but um, it can feel, you know, being a human existing in this world can feel very overwhelming sometimes, especially if you're a thoughtful person in any way or free thinking in any way. And I think what's important, really important for me was to learn what you can and can't change and what you can and can't have a direct impact on and scale what your expectations are to what your resources and abilities are. You know, like I am not going to cure cancer because I'm not a doctor. I can give money to those things, which I think is a very worthwhile cause. But in terms of hands-on approach of things I can change, I cannot do that. I I can't single-handedly solve climate change. 
you know, I can do my due diligence and do the things I can do as a citizen to contribute to, to helping that. But again, not something that I have the ability. I don't have $5 billion to fund a massive green research project. So I just, the first thing I did, and I would tell anybody is, like, what do you have? Do, do you have a spare hour every week? Could you two times a month go to the local food bank for three hours and pack boxes of cans? Maybe that's all you can do. Maybe you have three children and you don't have any time at all to do anything like that. But that could be as simple as, you know, chaperoning their field trip. I mean, I, I think it's easy to beat yourself up and feel like, especially if you're a caring person, to say, I, I'm not doing enough. And, you know, I don't think most of us are doing enough. But I also think that it's okay to have a realistic expectation of, of what that is that you think that you can achieve and then going forth from there and not being feeling held back. You know, two hours in someone's life a week, you could read to the elderly. I mean, it's like those things have an impact. So basically what I'm saying is I just looked at what am I good at? Who do I know? Another thing to look at if you want to, to help people is what of what of your friend who do you know that has a lot of money? <laughs> 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 who do you know that you could convince to help pay for a cause? You know, I'm friends with some people older than me who've had quite a bit of success that are looking to do philanthropic things. And one of them is the reason I was able to help restart the Boys and Girls Club Music Makers program. You know, he helped uh, immensely and gave me a generous grant so that I could purchase laptops and pro tools and, and, and uh, get that going there. So, you know, who do you know that could help, help do something or, or, or what organizations do you know that could each give a thousand dollars to make this thing a reality? Uh, so I think it's about taking an assessment first for anybody of who you are, how much time do you have, you know, what are your resources and, and sort of going from there. Love it, man. Yeah. I, I think that there's probably a lot of people listening to this that, feel that pull to do something, but don't know where to start. So I think you just gave a perfect, perfect answer there of, you know, how to get going with it. And yeah, yeah it's like, you're right. There's, there's, there's a lot of us aren't doing our, our part, you know, and we could all do a lot more. So, um, yeah, that's how I felt. I was tired of being the one who's complaining and not doing anything. And I'm like, okay, I complain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm going to, if I'm going to complain this much about the quote unquote state of the world, then maybe I can just do a little something in my corner of it and, and be realistic about that. And, you know, if you're a musician, that could be as simple as donating your time to t teach kids, teach a kid, a, one kid, a lesson every week, whatever, you know, I mean, that could have a huge impact on somebody's life. You, you never know. You, I hear stories all the time. It's unexpected sometimes where the impact for change will come from someone's life, you know? Totally big or small, like you can still affect people. Yeah. 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 Love it, man. That, that, I think that's a great spot to, to end on. Um, if people want to learn more about you or your charities um, and, you know, follow you online, what, what are the best places for them to do that? So uh, Athens Resonates is just at AthensResonates.com. Um, if you want to find out more about me, I have uh, VBergIndustries.com, which is V-B-E-R-G Industries.com. And uh, feel free to email me there through the form. Um, there's also chaseparktransduction.com, which is the studio I work out of. Um, that's a great place to ch check this place out. And, uh, yeah, I think that, I think that covers it. Awesome. Well, Drew, thanks again for being on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mike. Have a good one. So that was my interview with Drew Vandenberg, and I thought it was really interesting hearing his approach to miking up drums, and I love the way he uses XY techniques. And if you're curious to know what that looks like, I believe on his Instagram page, he does have a bunch of photos of some drum kits that he's miked up, and you'll notice that he, yeah, he doesn't use a stereo pair of overheads like a lot of people do. He does that XY technique, and you can see how he integrates that in his photos that he's got on there. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really cool to talk about the drum stuff, but I also really found the conversation about giving back to charity really fascinating as well because yeah it's something we haven't talked about on this podcast yet but i think that there is so much positive impact that we can all make with our careers and with our audio skills and just not just our audio skills but all of our skills in general and so it's great to see someone in the industry giving back to the community and making this a regular part of his life and i would definitely encourage all of you guys to try to find that way that you can give back to the community i, I know that for some of you you might be listening to this thinking it sounds a little like hokey pokey or or like woo woo or whatever but 
honestly, like there's something very rewarding to giving back to the community and, you know, giving to charity and all that kind of stuff. And if you have the ability to do so, do that, because I I think you're going to find it very rewarding. And yeah, there's a lot of people out there that are in need of this. So I love that Drew is actually making it happen and making an impact and really helping out these young kids in Athens, Georgia. Super cool. So I hope that you found this interview helpful and inspiring. And if you did, definitely make sure to subscribe to the podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live. And I say this every episode, but make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is a website where I help out musicians with creating pro-sounding recordings from their home studios. And there's so many great resources on there to check out. One of which you want to check out is called The Mixing Mindset. That is a book that I put out where I break down the process of mixing from beginning to end and make it super, super simple for you, walking you through all of the steps needed from knowing what to be listening for, what tools to be using, what steps to be taking, what order to work in, all that kind of stuff so that you can make mixes confidently and with ease. So definitely check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset. That's available at MasterYourMix.com. And also on the website, I've got a bunch of other great courses designed to help you go deeper with the tools like EQ and compression. Or if you're looking for specific one-on-one coaching and you would love help to either help you finish a record or really refine your system so that you can work fast, way more confident, and feel way more independent with your audio skills, I do also offer one-on-one coaching. And if you're interested in that, please send me an email. My email address is info at masteryourmix.com and just include the word coaching and we can talk about how we can make that happen and what your goals are and how I can help you achieve those goals. So once again, if you are interested in coaching, just send me an email with the word coaching in it and I would love to help you achieve your goals with music and help you build your career with it as well. So that is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to chatting with you in the next one. Take it easy. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.